Hello everyone! Welcome to the seminar series on Cognitive Robotics offered by the Queen Mary University of London. My name is Lorenzo Iamone. I am a senior lecturer in robotics here at Queen Mary. And in this video, I will introduce the research we do in the area of cognitive robotics. In particular, focusing on the intelligence of our hands. And uh, at Queen Mary, I, I lead CRISP, which is my team, Cognitive Robotics and Intelligence System for the People. In addition to that, uh, I collaborate to different research groups. The main one being ARC, ARQ, the Advanced Robotics at Queen Mary. But in addition to that, I collaborate with two other research groups. One is the Cognitive Science Research Group, and the other one is the Center for Intelligence Sensing. And this is because my research and the research of my team is um, fits uh, the research agenda of all these different uh, groups. So a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, I, as I may told you already, I'm uh, Italian by birth. Um, and uh, I did study my undergraduate and uh, master degrees in, uh, in Genoa, in Italy, and also my PhD at the University of Genoa. And then I did my PhD at the Italian Institute of Technology, which uh, by that time was a brand new institute created by the Italian government, and uh, now has become quite a popular center for research, is the leading center of uh, uh, research uh, in Italy. Uh, and I did my, my PhD uh, working with the, uh, some of the people mentioned there. And uh, after that, I moved to Japan, to Tokyo, Waseda University, uh, specifically in the uh, laboratory of Professor Takanishi and in the group, uh, which is called the Biped Group, which is the group in which the first humanoid robot was created in the early 70s. And, uh, and then after a couple of years in Japan, where I was working as a, as a researcher, I moved to Portugal, to Lisbon, and I've been there for about four years, working as a researcher in the Instituto Superior Tecnico. Um, and uh, in um, December 2016, I joined Queen Mary as a lecturer, and, uh, and still I am. And uh, I will quick, uh, I will give a quick uh, summary of the research I've been uh, done in those places. And then I will give a few more information about the research that my team is doing uh, at the moment here at Queen Mary. So uh, the, one of the central theme, or let's say the central objective of my PhD was to enable uh, a robot that you see here in the video to learn autonomously how to reach for objects that were detected by vision. By autonomously, I mean that uh, we didn't write uh, analytical models of the robot body, for example, the robot uh, kinematics or the robot dynamic model. Uh, we didn't write any of them. Instead, the robot was starting, uh, so the, the programs uh, we the robot was starting with, they didn't have any knowledge about the shape or the functionalities of the robot. The only thing the robot knew in the beginning was that it could move, right? It could actuate the motors and those movements will generate some movements. And, um, and then the robot was collecting information in real time online and understanding the mapping or the relationship between the movement of the motors and the effects that those movements had in, um, in the real world. Right. So, for example, the fact that if we move some of the motors of the arm, then the hand will move in a certain direction. And, uh, and so you can see here some um, evolutions of the robot in which in the beginning the robot is attempting to, uh, to reach for some object. So the target object is this red ball that I'm moving in front of the robot. And the robot is moving the head and then it will start to move the arm. And uh, initially, the, the direction of movement is, is not correct, as you can see. But the robot is collecting uh, data, uh, vision data from what he sees from the cameras in the eyes, and motor data from the movements that he's generating, and then mapping them together. And after a while, he's able to, 
eventually touch the object, even by real-time adaptation. And after several hours of learning, in which I was showing this uh, ball in different places, then the robot is uh, it becomes reliably able to to reach for objects, and so this is a combination of uh, uh, of uh, engineering uh, and uh, signal processing, but also machine learning applied to robot control. And uh, the same idea I then uh, evolved and um, uh, worked on when I went to Japan. And in that case, I was working with this uh, full humanoid robot that in this case uh, is, uh, is also learning incrementally and online, not just to reach with, the, with one arm, but to reach with the entire body. Basically, what the robot is learning is if I'm looking at an object and I am with a certain posture of my body, can I just reach for that object by moving the arm or do i need to change the posture of my body right and so in the in the initial phases the robot will only move the arm and some object will not be reachable but after a while then the robot becomes able to move to recruit other degrees of motion so to move the legs and to move the torso and therefore being able to perform this uh, that we call whole body reaching. When I moved to Portugal, I started exploring another aspect of uh, robot learning, which is not learning about the own body and how to move the own body, but learning about the external objects and the external world. And in this case, you see this robot with the iCAP playing with different objects. And some of the object is using them as tools. Some other objects are acted upon. They're lying on the table. And while doing so, the robot is collecting visual information about these objects and tool. And after learning has uh, evolved, then the robot is able, for example, to select, in this case, what will be the best tool among the two options in order to pull another object closer. And you can see that we tested this initially with the same objects that the robot had learned, but then with new objects, right? So in this case, these tools are tools that the robot never seen, have never seen before. But basically the robot is able to, the robot has now learned that some specific visual characteristics of tools are important to solve this specific task. And we call these object affordances. So what are the uh, the visual perception of possible uses of an object. And so here we showed that the robot was uh, good at learning, but also at generalizing that knowledge to new situations. All right, so, and this is just uh, uh, a quick um, summary of the research that I've been doing as a I would say an independent researcher, first as a, a PhD student and then as a postdoc. And uh, after that, I, I joined Queen Mary. And uh, this is just some general information about Queen Mary you probably know already about, but uh, Queen Mary is one of the uh, Russell Group universities and we are ranked 100 in the world. Especially, we are a research intensive university, meaning that uh, compared to other universities, our research is, uh, is particularly good. And uh, in fact, for research, we are ranked nine in the UK. And uh, as you probably know, we are very uh, diverse and inclusive. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this year, there, is, there, are, there has been so far little chances for enjoying the campus and meeting other students. But uh, hopefully this will change uh, in, the, in the next future. And you will be able to see how, uh, what's the actual composition of, the, of our students. And uh, at Queen Mary, the main group, uh, as I mentioned, that, I, um, that, I, uh, that I'm part of is uh, ARQ, Advanced Robotics. You may know already Professor Kaspar Altofer, who is the head of the group. In general, the robotics group, which started in 2016, is now quite uh, quite large. It, it includes a lot of uh, academics, 
Some of them are core robotics researchers. Some others are, are associated uh, to ARC, uh, although their main uh, research topic is not main, maybe not robotics, but AI, computer vision, but also, um, for example, uh, human studies uh, like psychology, neuroscience, uh, uh, sport medicine. So we have different people who are, uh, we collaborate with. And uh, one interesting aspect of the robotic uh, uh, group uh, is that we approach robotic from a different point of view. So we, we create new robots, so we can make robot bodies, but we also make robot brains. We also make software for robotic intelligence. And you see some of the examples here. For example, on the top right, you have this uh, octopus robot, which is something that uh, it's a robot made of soft materials that uh, we created. So it's a new robot. But also on the uh, bottom side, you see a system made up by two industrial robotic manipulators equipped with different grippers and with some vision sensors like Kinect. And those are uh, commercial robotic system that we combine together and then we program them to achieve something interesting, like in this case, the bimanual manipulation of this uh, bottle. And in addition to that, we create or we update other things such as this uh, uh, wheelchair that has become a robotic wheelchair and that a team of students in ARC uh, are updating with the additional technology in order to participate to the Cybatron competition. And, and there are several other things we do. And if you are interested, please uh, check the, the web page of, of ARC to know more. But I wanted to talk a bit more about the research we do in, uh, in my team, which is uh, focused on cognitive robotics. Uh, and as you know, for cognitive robotics, we are interested in creating smart robots, both from a hardware, but especially from a software point of view, right? Creating intelligent robots, creating the programs that make robots intelligent. Uh, but at the same time, we want to understand more about human intelligence, and we do so by doing uh, directly uh, human studies, uh, by reading papers of psychology, neuroscience, by talking to our colleagues uh, in the different departments, including uh, psychology, and then by implementing some of these solutions, by inspired solution into the robot and check whether these solutions work well for the robot. Because the fact that a solution that is inspired by a theory in psychology works well in the robot, it can be a further proof that this theory coming from psychology might be actually uh, might be actually true theory, uh, might be actually a true explanation of what happens in humans. And here in the picture, you see um, the PhD students in my team. Uh, some of them you have met also this morning in the lab, uh, Rodrigo and Tom and others you may also get to know later as they may uh, join this module by giving some uh, presentations. Right, and so cognitive robotics, of course, is a very, uh, is very general, is a very wide topic. So what we mainly focus in, uh, in our team, in CRISP, is what I call the intelligence of our hands. So the extraordinary ability we humans have to use our hands to grasp and manipulate objects, to uh, explore the external environment and understand more about properties of the environment, and even to communicate with each other. And, uh, and as you may see from some of the logos, uh, this, uh, this research is uh, is quite relevant for the UK and for the world. And in fact, several uh, funding bodies like EPSRC, the Royal Society, these are governmental institutions who give money for research, but also companies have been supporting our research uh, because they think uh, it can be uh, relevant for them and for the country in general, for the world. Right, so uh, I'll give you um, a quick summary of some of the activities uh, we do and uh, which mainly are uh, uh, it's mainly research done by the phd student and uh, researchers in, in my team and uh, myself i act as a supervisor so 
I, I just uh, follow them and uh, lead them and encourage them, but most of the research, the actual research is done by, is by, is done by them. Uh, right, so I, I separated in four parts. We start the first one, uh, tactile perception. Right, so uh, what is tactile perception? So, you know, in uh, humans, the sense of touch is very important. We use it for several things, but one of the most important thing that we do, uh, that the sense of touch enables us doing, is to uh, manipulate and understand objects. The sense of touch is present in the, is, is, so we, we detect touch by receptors that are in our skin, but uh, especially we have uh, um, a very high density of these receptors in our fingertips and in our hands. And that's why the sense of touch is so important for manipulating and understanding objects. And specifically what we do through the sense of touch is to, for example, detect uh, the location of contacts and the shape of the contact when we contact objects or environments. We understand how much pressure we are making. We can get information about the texture of objects. Uh, we can feel temperature, we can feel pain, etc. other things. But especially the first three, contact, pressure and textures are those quantities that are important to detect when we want to manipulate objects and to gather more information about them. And in the skin, as I said, we have uh, um, receptors that allow us to, uh, to, uh, to understand these uh, external properties. And the main thing these uh, receptors do, which are called mechanoreceptors, uh, we have different kinds of them, but all mechanoreceptors, they, uh, they, they are able to sense a deformation of the skin, the deformation of the skin make this mechanoreceptor to move slightly and they convert this mechanical stimulation so this deformation and movement into a neural signal that is then sent to our brain and then our brain makes sense of these perceptions and uh, i want to focus here on two specific kind of receptors that we have one is uh, uh, in red here merkel discs these are these small organs here and these are quite important, are very important for detecting pressure and force. So they are uh, crucial when we want to regulate the, the force that we apply to object when we grasp them. Uh, for example, so that the, our grasp uh, of an object is uh, robust and the objects do not fall. Uh, another one is the hair follicle receptor. So we have... Uh, um, hairs in our, on our skin. Uh, some of us, they have more, some of us, they are less. I, I, I have several, as you can see, in my arm, for example, or in my hands. And, uh, and these hair are connected to, to receptors in the lower level of our, uh, of our skin. And again, uh, this, they detect, uh, the receptor down below detects the small movements of the, of the air. Um, and then creates a neural signal that is sent to the brain. And, and so these are very important to detect uh, a very, very light contact with external environments. So by this, for example, with our hair, we can, uh, we can detect the, the airflow, for example, of the wind over our, over our skin, uh, but even very light contacts that occur on the air before occurring on the skin. And by taking inspiration from these two different kinds of, uh, uh, of receptors, we created two different classes of tactile sensors that have different interesting properties. The red one, more um, important to detect uh, contact forces and to, um, let's say, to precisely measure the contact forces. And the other one to detect uh, very uh, small uh, movement and this very small movement can be related to sense the texture to de determine the texture of something that we are touching and I will tell you briefly how these are uh, how these are made in practice so the the main idea behind this uh, tactile sensor is that we embed a small magnet into a soft material the soft material can be deformed upon touch 
And then below, we have a, a 3D uh, magnetic sensor, in this case, a whole effect sensor. So this is a sensor that can detect the three-dimensional magnetic field generated by this magnet. So now when a force is applied, either a normal force or a shear force, which is a force parallel to the surface, the magnet is displaced from its uh, original position. And therefore, the magnetic field measured by the magnetic sensor changes. And by measure this difference in the magnetic field, we can estimate the uh, forces applied uh, on the soft material. And uh, we made several different prototypes of this sensor. In this case, we, uh, this is collaboration with the university in Japan. We put several of this sensor on the fingertip of a robot. And you see here that the robot is able to maintain the grip of this very delicate object. This is a plastic cup. So if you, if you press too much, you will crush it. Uh, but it's able, in this case, the robot to apply just the right amount of force. And even when we change the, the weight of the, of the cup, so you see that we add additional object inside, and also we move it, the robot is able to, to maintain a, a robust grasp, but not to apply, not by not applying too much force, but just the exactly the force which is required. And this is because with the sensor, we can determine the location of the contact quite precisely because we have many sensitive units and also the 3D force applied. So not just the location of the force and the intensity of the force, but also the direction of the applied force. The second type of sensor uh, which is um, mainly work by Pedro Ribeiro, who is a PhD student who is uh, doing a joint PhD between Queen Mary and uh, uh, Portugal. Is done by, uh, let me start this video again. Uh, so the second sensor is, uh, we call artificial cilia, is a tiny uh, cilia of uh, soft material in which we embed ferromagnetic particles which then are magnetized over a common direction. So again, we have a, a magnetic sensor in the bottom, in this case, a magnetoresisting sensor. And when the cilia is moved, the magnetic sensor can detect the movement. And so, as you can see here in this video, we are able to detect small movement of the cilia or even larger movement, and also the direction of this movement. Where does the movement come from? And, uh, and because these cilia are so sensitive, we can use them to detect, uh, to characterize, to finally characterize surfaces. So in this case, this big black thing is a robot moving over a metallic sheet. And the metallic sheet, there are some grooves. And the idea is that when there are some imperfection or some small groove on a surface, the cilia will bend just a little bit. And by analyzing the signal, we can precisely characterize where these imperfections are and uh, uh, what is their dimension. And we have done similar experiment by touching different fruits and basically trying to estimate whether fruits are, uh, are ripe or rotten. And here again, we pass this cilia over the fruit and by analyzing both the stiffness and, uh, and, and the texture of the fruit, we can classify, we're able to classify fruits very successfully on whether they were ripe or rotten, right? And basically the idea is that if you, if you move over the surface of the sensor, you can estimate, uh, sorry, if you move over the surface of the fruit, you can estimate the texture, while if you on the fruit, you can estimate uh, the stiffness by looking at the signal coming from the sensor. And if you want to know more about this, uh, we have uh, several publications um, about that. And um, you can also, of course, ask me more details. Now, how about uh, grasping objects? So for this, we, uh, our students who are working on grasping, specifically Brice and Rodrigo, they're using 
uh, different uh, sensing modalities, computer vision and also uh, tactile sensing, in order to make a grasp stables. And uh, the, the main assumption that we do is that the robot should not know anything about those objects in advance. So if you look at industrial manufacturing, in many cases, grasping object is relatively easy because previous information is available. So for example, you know already where the object is, you know already the, the shape, uh, uh, accurate 3D representation of the object, you know already uh, the stiffness of the object, and in those cases, grasping object will be relatively easy or very easy sometimes. If you don't know those things, then uh, things become more difficult. And so, however, you, you do need access to that information. So if you don't have it, you have to uh, gather that information through sensing. And now, the way uh, uh, humans use their senses to gather important information is through direct sensing, but also through learning, or let's say memory, of what they know about, uh, about objects. And, uh, and this in uh, artificial system is done by, uh, is also done by, by learning and real time sensing. And uh, typically, if you want to grasp objects based on computer vision, so if you want to collect information about the position of objects and their shape from computer vision, um, there are two main approaches. One is to use some um, uh, computer vision and signal processing in order to detect specific information in the image. For example, you can detect uh, the centroid of an object or find the, the where flat surfaces of an object are. And based on those detection, make specific computations and uh, find the best grasp for an object. Or you can train some uh, neural network and in that case, the neural network will tell you uh, basically the same thing. Will tell you what is the best um, the best position, the best pose of the gripper in order to grasp a specific object. And both of these approaches have pros and cons. Right? So the analytical approaches they are based on uh, common sense knowledge that we know uh, things that are important for grasping objects. The data-based approach, so machine learning, deep learning, are based on data. So depending on what data has been used for training the systems, they might be able to generalize well or less well to similar object or different object. And so um, what we wanted to do was to compare, uh, to start different algorithms, some analytical and some uh, learning-based, to see in practical application, when we have to grasp several objects, which one perform uh, best. And to do that, Breeze has developed a very nice software uh, package that is called GRIP, and that is uh, largely based on ROS, but it adds a lot of functionalities and a lot of uh, 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 graphical user interfaces so that it makes easier to program these tasks. And uh, Brice may present this to you um, later on. And with this, we were able to, uh, to do uh, several different uh, uh, robotic, to, to program several different robotic tasks. And uh, specifically, we, as I said, we wanted to compare different algorithms. And so we took four different algorithms, four, two um, based on uh, deep learning and two based on analytical approaches. And then we were classifying the results of the grasps in these six different categories, right? Either uh, completely stable or partially stable or unstable or completely missed or touched, but uh, then missed. And, uh, and we made a lot of different grasping of different objects by using these different algorithms to find out uh, in which situation uh, one algorithm were working better than other and comparing them with the statistical analysis. And something we find out is that uh, deep learning based algorithms are very successful with a certain number of, in a certain number of situations, 
but if we go to slightly different conditions from uh, the condition in which the system was trained, then they get catastrophic errors. While the analytical ones are maybe less good than the learning based for a certain scenario, but they might be more robust to changes in the situation. And by situation, I mean, for example, if we take the same algorithm and we move the position of the, of the Kinect, of the visual sensor, and we change the point of view, then the ones made, uh, based on deep learning may not be as successful. And this is about uh, computer using computer vision for grasping. Uh, Rodrigo is working on using tactile sensing for grasping. And uh, here we have uh, a flat tactile sensor mounted on this gripper. And when the gripper grasps different objects, you can see that very different kind of tactile signatures appear. And so this information could be used to classify the different objects. And in addition, this information can be used in order to detect slip. And it's very important to detect slip because we don't want that to happen. And you see here the output of the sensor, of the tactile sensor. And you can see that this uh, slowly changes while the object is, uh, is slipping down. And you might see that, especially in the beginning, it was much easier to notice the slip by looking at the output of the sensor than by looking at the actual video. Right. And, uh, and this is just uh, one, uh, um, one motivation that shows how uh, the tactile sensing is important to detect the slip, which sometimes may not be even noticeable from vision. We have uh, a large project that we are involved with our team, which is for uh, robots for nuclear decommissioning. And uh, one thing that is important in uh, nuclear decommissioning is that you may have to manipulate objects um, that are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, dangerous. So first thing you you have to do in uh, you have in nuclear decommissioning is that. You don't have previous information about the object. You don't know what object you're going to be handling, right? And this relates to what I discussed before. But also, you may want to be very safe on manipulating things. So before grasping an object, you, you really want to make sure the object is not going to fall. And in those cases, we can do something additional to the earlier vision detection and the later slip detection with tactile sensing, which is so-called haptic exploration, which is to go there and touch the object in different position to really make sure that the kind of grasp that we apply, it's the, the safest and the most robust one. And these things might be uh, things that in certain application you don't do because they will take longer time. So for example, in logistics, if uh, you are Amazon and you want to have automatic packing of uh, some uh, things, you, you may want to be faster rather than safe. But in other application, you want to be safe rather than fast. And, uh, and we do this uh, with a couple of ideas that are inspired to what uh, people do. And the first one is to use uh, uh, Bayesian optimization but a special kind of Bayesian optimization, which is called unscented Bayesian optimization. And I, I won't go into the detail of this, but the main idea is that we, by using this formulation, we consider uncertainty, meaning that we assume that the robot movements and also the robot perception coming, for example, from vision is never going to be completely accurate. There is going to be some uh, some noise in the image, some inaccuracy in the movement. So instead of saying, OK, we know that the robot can move to position A exactly, we assume that there is that there might be an error in the movement of the robot or in the perception of the robot. And that, uh, that error, we model it with a uh, probabilistic distribution. And we use that information in order to 
drive our search for the best grasp. Right? So considering uncertainty, it's something that definitely the, the, uh, the human brain does anytime we plan for our actions. Because we know ourselves and our brain does know very well that uh, things are never done in a completely accurate way. And the other, um, the other idea that we take from, uh, uh, let's say, from, from people and from the real world is the use of symmetry assumption. So uh, what I mean by that is that if you think about it, most of the objects that we encounter in our life and that we manipulate, they have some sort of symmetry. It might be symmetry with respect to an axis of rotation. It might be symmetry with respect to a plane. But most objects are, they show some kind of symmetry. Now, if you think about optic object exploration, which basically is to try to understand the shape of an object simply by touching in different positions, if you, if you assume that there might be a symmetry, then the number of times you have to touch an object is, is reduced. Right? And, uh, and we think, and uh, other people uh, in uh, um, other uh, uh, disciplines think, that the human brain automatically does that assumption. And while we explore an object, we keep in mind that there might be a symmetry. And if we detect that symmetry, at some, at some point we will trust that there is a symmetry. And then we don't need to explore uh, so much of the object because we know there is a symmetry. And Augusto is trying to combine this with the uh, Bayesian exploration techniques that uh, Sam is using. About manipulation. So manipulation is uh, a step forward from grasping. So in order to do manipulation, you first need to have a stable grasp, and then you can manipulate an object. So this is more complex. The way we approach this is not for the robot to, uh, uh, to learn this just from data uh, that are, uh, let's say, uh, gathered by the robot or provided elsewhere, but to learn it directly from a human person. And so what we do here, uh, this is work of uh, Gyokan, is to provide a demonstration to a robot of how a certain manipulation action should be achieved, and then the robot to reproduce it. And the crucial aspect here is to represent this movement and, the, and to represent the mathematical space in which we provide, in which uh, uh, we define the movement in such a way that this knowledge can be then generalized so that we demonstrate an action on one object, but then the robot is able to reproduce the same action on a different object, like a larger object or object with a, a different shape. And um, uh, we do that by using a combination of uh, control theory techniques, in particular, the virtual spring framework and uh, which is basically a, a way of defining how the different fingers will collaborate together in order to keep the grasp. And then some learning technique, which is dynamic movement primitives, which is a, a technique to define a movement and learn this movement from human demonstration. And then tactile feedback, in order to make the grasp more robust. So we use a combination of these different things. So we take the learning component through the human demonstration, but we combine it with control theory techniques and online real-time sensing. And this is in the context of a bigger project that we have in my team in which uh, we collaborate with different companies. And the long-term goal is to provide this demonstration, not just by moving the robot finger, which is a bit uh, inconvenient, but to obtain this by teleoperation. 
and uh, cloud is working on this and by teleoperation i mean that the human user will move their hand we detect the movement and we pass them to the robot and when the robot touches something we provide the feeling of what the robot is touching to the user by using these vibrating motors here and we made um, a user study so far in simulation in which we demonstrate that providing this uh, so-called uh, haptic feedback or in this case vibrotactile feedback uh, is particularly helpful when the tasks that we ask the user to do are more difficult so we in this case we the the task were the manipulation of objects of different sizes and either grasp or manipulate and when tasks become more difficult the fact that you have this tactile feedback on your fingers it becomes much more beneficial rather than having just the the vision of the of the task and this is a further proof that in general tactile sensation and tactile feedback is very helpful for manipulation and uh, the way in which we uh, provide this feedback is uh, is also uh, dependent on specifically what kind of information about the object we want to give to the user so of course a very simple way of providing the feedback with the, the vibrations is that when the robot touches something and let's say the the pressure measured by the robot is over a certain threshold then you provide some vibration to the glove just on off and this is the very simple way of doing it which we used in this initial user study that i just mentioned but we can do something more and give the feeling of specific object properties and we have done also some testing in, in that sense specifically to provide the feeling of object stiffness so whether an object is hard or soft and the feeling of object texture right and uh, what we saw in our result is that even by using technology which is uh, very uh, very simple and very cheap in terms of uh, uh, vibrating motors the ones that we are using here are the cheapest solution available they just cost a few pounds each so it's a very affordable system even in that case uh, we can provide a feeling of object stiffness and i won't go in the details of the result but if you are interested you can also look at the papers we can provide a feeling of object stiffness and we can provide a feeling of object texture and specifically for the object textures we tested users in three different conditions in the blue condition the users so this is how, we, how this uh, work um, the user are presented with these five different objects that have different texture one is um, a rubber one is wood one is paper one is cloth and then they will they will move the hand back and forth over the uh, lip motion sensor that tracks the position of the finger and they will receive a stimulation on the on the fingertip right so as they as if they were virtually rubbing uh, this uh, material okay. and we tested users in three conditions in a uh, blue condition the users have no previous training and no previous experience about those uh, real textures they they move the finger on the sensor and we ask them which is which one is this texture is this the wood or is it the paper right. in the red condition first we give the real textures to the user to to touch with their own hand before so that they get a feeling of what do those things look like feels like in the third condition in the yellow one we we give them the textures in the beginning to, to touch and while they touch them we provide the corresponding stimulation on the on the fingertip so that they can experience and learn the mapping from the real texture to the haptic uh, feedback 
And so here you see what is the accuracy of their judgment when we then test them. And of course, their accuracy increases if they receive more training, especially their accuracy is very good uh, if they had received previous training with previous experience. However, even in the blue condition, in which they don't have any training or any previous experience, they didn't even touch the real textures, but they can only see them, uh, they, are still, uh, they still do better than chance. The chance will be here, and they still do better than that. So their replies are still more accurate than chance, meaning that this uh, feedback already gives them the idea of the texture they are touching. Okay, last but not least, and quickly, I will give you, uh, I will describe also two experiments, and these are um, um, human experiments that we do in order to find out something about the importance of the hands in social interaction. And of course, finding out that can be also important to design better human robot interaction. So the first uh, topic, which is uh, studied by HM, is about miscommunications. How do we move our hands when we are talking to each other and we don't understand each other? So as you know, people move their hands when they talk. Some people, they do more. Some people, they do less. What we are looking here is how these movements change in cases in which we do not understand each other. And of course, this could be interesting in human-robot interaction, because if you have a human interacting with a robot or with a robotic system, and the human is uh, maybe talking to the robot or communicating, and they have to do something together, if we could detect just by looking at the hand movements, if the human didn't understand, that would be very helpful. And the second project is on uh, musical rhythm perception. And specifically, we are looking at how moving our hands, but also looking at someone else moving, helps us to understand a musical rhythm. So you may know uh, just by uh, experience that if you are listening to a musical rhythm, imagine like, a, I don't know, a rock song with some drums. Uh, if, you, if you move your hands and if you tap, for example, if you tap along, like this, or clap your hands, it will be easier for your brain to, to follow the rhythm, right? So the fact that you are doing a movement, it will help your brain to, to understand the rhythm. It's not just the auditory perception. The fact that you are doing an action will help your brain to, be, to understand the rhythm better. What we are looking at in this study is whether looking at someone else moving is also helpful. And we have some initial, um, some initial uh, suggestion that might be the case. All right. This is all for me. I think it took a bit longer than expected, but still within the hour. Uh, Oscar, would you like to ask something? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, that was really cool. Um, Talk. Thank you. Um, the you showed us the example of the robot that, that held the the fragile uh, plastic cup, um, and you didn't want to break it. How how does it know how much force to apply? Is it just sheer force, sort of minimizing sheer force while also minimizing sort of mm -hmm. sideways force? Yeah. So there, yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, so there are a couple of different ways. Uh, so in general, uh, the idea would be to uh, so at the point of contact. The idea, let's say, let's say, the, just look at one finger, the index finger on the on this cup. At the point of contact, you will like to know the both, so the three-dimensional component of the applied force. So ideally, both the force, so the the it's a, the force is a three three D vector, right? So ideally, this will be composed by normal a normal component and the shear component, right? So ideally, you may want to know all of it. And the reason is that, of course, in order to make the grasp more robust, uh, you may want to, you, you have 
assuming you have multiple fingers, but even if you have two, you may want to, uh, to have a certain set of forces and all together, the forces generated by the different fingers should balance the object. So it's not just how much normal force you apply, but it's really the direction of this force with respect to the direction that is applied by other forces. In some cases, it might be that just increasing the normal force, if you increase it more, you make it more stable. But of course, it might not be the best one because it might be too much force and you may crush the object. So, so that's ideally what you want to do in terms of uh, stabilizing the grasp. Uh, then, um, another approach is that you, you grasp an object and you make, uh, you start typically with the, with the initial prediction or initial guess of how much force you want to apply. This is when, when we humans grasp anything, we have already in our brain, we start with a prediction. We always start with a prediction. And that's based on your previous knowledge about the object you are going to grasp. Even if you don't know anything about an object, you will always have a tentative guess of how much force to apply. Once you have applied, once you have applied the first uh, force, then what we humans do is that we quickly do a, an adaptation of that force based on slip detection. So if we detect that the object is slipping, we apply a bit more, let's say. Uh, a bit more, but also in the right direction. You may not notice it when you do it, uh, but, that's, but that's what we do. Um, uh, is that all for an answer? Yeah, no, that's great. I was also, I mean, there's other people asking questions, so I don't want to take over, but if I may, a follow up. Yeah. Um, to what extent do, in robotics, do you use, like, if I lift up, um, say the kettle and give it a swirl to see how much water there is in. I sort of uh -huh. use the fact that it's it's pushing back against me. Do, do, to what extent yeah. do you use that kind of feedback to also understand weight or distribution of weight or things like that? Uh, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, it is it may be used in certain applications, but uh, this is one of the uh, kind of things that uh, uh, it's, it's it's still more in the research environment. But uh, I can definitely think of uh, a few researches I've, I've came across in which they were doing that in order, for example, to estimate, uh, uh, yeah, exactly that, like the the uh, the liquid content of a container in which you can't see inside. So, uh, and this is uh, in general, this is something that in psychology is uh, always referred to as uh, uh, ecological perception. Uh, or and the most specifically active perception. So active perception is any time you do some action in order to make your perception better. And so for example, shaking the object or moving the object in a certain way is, um, is a form of active perception. It's also ecological perception in the sense of uh, the idea that you, when uh, humans are perceiving reality, uh, we do perceive things for specific purposes. If you if you are looking around or if you are touching something, you never your brain will never try to completely reconstruct everything. They will they will try to uh, gather specific information for what you want to do. That's the approach we do because it's a, an economic approach. You cannot perceive everything, right? And so uh, yeah, the example you make is both an example of active and also ecological. So you do a specific action in order to gather specific information. That's basically thanks. Uh, cool, so I see a couple of questions in the chat. I will try to answer a few of them at least. Um, can you give us an idea of the components of the machine learning model for robotic grasping? Uh, so I take your dependent variable is whether the graph attempt succeeded, failed. What are the independent variables? Position of finger pressure. Yes. Uh, okay. So I can give you just a couple of general examples for the um, uh, few algorithms that we tested. That those were based on learning. Uh, these are algorithms that we took uh, as pre-trained. So we didn't train the algorithms ourselves. And uh, typically, uh, most of the uh, deep learning-based, uh, machine learning-based algorithms for uh, robotic grasping they um, their output is just uh, it 
it's, it's just two classes, successful or not successful. So, so, and this is likely different from the analysis we did that was a bit more thorough as we looked at different categories of why and how the GRASP was successful. But typically those algorithms are trained in, um, in terms of uh, uh, label the GRASP as either successful or not, which is also, let's say, one limitation of, in my opinion, of uh, some of those approaches, however, is to limit the complexity, right? Because it's easier. And, uh, and typically, the, the independent variables are, uh, so, so again, for many of the algorithms that are available and also those that we tested, uh, is the relative pose of the gripper with respect to the object. So in this case, we use the simple gripper. And so the only possible action you can do is to close it or open it. And we were closing with, the, let's say, with the maximum force up to a threshold. Then we were doing the tactile part after, but for the grasping itself, we were just closing. So the, the variable that we were, uh, uh, let's say, the output of the network will be uh, the relative pose of the gripper with respect to the object. Pose is a combination of position and orientation. So ideally, it's a six dimensional. However, in most cases in grasping, people reduce that to either three or four dimension. So it might be, for example, top grasp. So only say X, Y position and one or two degrees of orientations. So in many of the system that you, that you have uh, and that people are uh, doing, this is the, the way it is reduced. And this is for what we tried, and it's very popular uh, to do it this way. Of course, ideally, you can use any other. Uh, I mean, you can use the position of different fingers if you have a uh, if you have a multi-fingered hand. So the position of the fingertips over the object. You can use the amount of pressure, uh, except the amount of force generated by the motors, etc. Yeah. Uh, okay, there is a question for students who have not studied robotics before, but want to learn more about the field. Is it worth reading about control theory signal processes? Right, so robotics is very, very uh, multidisciplinary and very general, very wide. So uh, it's, it's hard to say if you, if you haven't studied robotics before, how much should you dwell into control theory and signal processing? Um, there are there are so many different aspects. Of course, uh, control theory and signal processing are crucial aspects of uh, robotic uh, control. Uh, the there are uh, let's say there are general books on robotics. Uh, one is, for example, the book that. Uh, uh, that I recommend for the advanced robotic system. But also um, there is, for example, the Springer Handbook of Robotics. I just put it here, which is uh, um, a very general book on different topics of robotics. And you may start from there and then see, also depending on your personal interest and the background, what it's, let's say, easier to start with and which area do you want to improve more? But yes, control theory and signal processing are, are important, but, um, but other things are important as well, or the field of AI is important, uh, computer vision, sensing. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if, I mean, apart like all the mechanical engineering, electronics, uh, et cetera, which is also possibly important if you are more on the hardware side. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Um, okay, in terms of grasp, uh, you mentioned that the arm tried to grasp the object in different position to find the best position to grasp it. Uh, how do you define the next position to explore? If there are find it easy to grasp. What is, okay, so yeah, so the, I think this question is related to the haptic exploration in which we had, uh, in that case, the 
hand with several fingers and we were touching the object trying to find the best grasp uh, so uh, so when you do those kind of things first thing you have to define what a good grasp is so you need the sort of metric and as I mentioned before one possible metric that you can use is that you compute the forces if you have sensors that measure it you compute the contact forces and based on the net force so the sum of all the contact forces you uh, you can assign a value high or low depending on how stable uh, those forces are so but any in any and that could be one there could be a different metrics that is typically called the force closure metrics there might be metrics that just evaluate the positions of the fingertip, not necessarily the force. So, for example, if you want to grasp this object, these positions look more uh, robust than this. If you don't know how much force it has been applied, and those metrics are called form closure metrics, so they're related to the form, not the force. But so, yeah, first thing you do is uh, some sort of metric that will tell you whether each grasp is good or not. The way to find the next position to explore, in our case, was done with the uh, Bayesian optimization. And uh, I won't go into details, but Bayesian optimization is a, uh, is a black box uh, estimation te optimization technique that does exactly that. When you are exploring a certain space, uh, which for which you have a metric so you have a way of telling if, if one point is better than the other but you don't have a function so you don't know what is the output of one point and what is the output of another point you don't know that in advance because of course if you will know that in advance then is problem solved but these are cases in which you know you know to compute the metric but you don't know the output of the metric for every point you have to go and try right so basically, you have to build an estimation of this function. And Bayesian optimization does exactly that. It will put is the best point to explore in order to build the best possible estimation of this function. And it's called Bayesian optimization because it does that by looking at, uh, at the variance of your data and basically reducing trying to reduce at each step the uncertainty of your overall function. Uh, I won't give any more detail because they're a bit tough, but that's the, that's the gist of it. And on top of that, we were using a specific kind of Bayesian optimization, which is called unsented, which considers uncertainty even more, let's say. Uh, I'll suggest if you are specifically interested in that, uh, you can check uh, the paper that was mentioned in the slides, or if there was no paper, you can send me an email and I will send you a paper. Why do we need haptic feedback when using human interaction? What is the need for the user to feel the texture? Uh, yes, so uh, for example, uh, well, you may have situation in which you want to uh, um, there, there might be a situation in teleoperation in which you really want to evaluate if, uh, if a remote thing is uh, as a certain texture or not. But uh, one thing that is very related to texture is uh, uh, sleep detection, right? So at least uh, if you know the texture of an object, your estimation of uh, whether it will be slippery or not is much easier. So, so that's one of the reason, and the reason why. Um, and so, optic feedback. It's important to get the texture, yes, but also the the stiffness and the force that you are applying to an object. Right? Uh, but the one of the reason for the texture might be uh, that, uh, um, yeah, to to basically see that if there is a slip, because. The slip uh, is basically uh, a relative movement of the object and the fingers. And this is uh, the same thing that you do when you uh, um, explore a texture. 
Uh, of course, texture might be also important for recognizing an object. Maybe you are touching something remotely with a robot. So you want to know what that is, and defining with the texture can be important also to help you understanding what kind of object that is. Are there any programmable consumer product available for us to try some robotic at home? Uh, well, um, I think there are, I mean, there are some, uh, let's say, cheap uh, uh, Arduino controlled robots. Uh, so th there are several like uh, mobile robots, like robot cars, let's say, maybe 50 pounds or uh, a little bit more. You can probably get a decent kit for that. Uh, okay, yeah, there was Arduino was mentioned already. But there are also, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure there are also ARMS. Uh, there might, uh, to be honest, I never try them, but it might be good for, uh, you know, for kind of practicing and getting some uh, visual idea of uh, how a robot moves. Uh, to be honest, I never tried the, the robotic arms. But, um, and these I'm talking about things probably in the range of a few hundred pounds. Uh, then, of course, if you go on with the price, uh, yeah, you, you have more options. But I think there should be something around for that amount. Arduino or similar things. These are things you can find on Amazon uh, or on uh, SparkFun or some other online uh, uh, shops. OK. Are there any studies on the complexity human cognitive models are able to receive, uh, are able to achieve? Uh, yes. Um, well, of course, there is no final answer. I mean, uh, if, if, if by that you mean uh, what are the cognitive models, so the artificial models, uh, that are, let's say, more complex and can reproduce more complex human uh, thinking and behaviors. Um, in uh, week six, uh, we are going to have a lecture on uh, cognitive architectures. Uh, and I'll give a couple of examples of some of the cognitive architectures, so like uh, complete cognitive models that try to explain really uh, uh, the combination of uh, different mental processes and behaviors of the human brain. Uh, of course, they are all like simplifications in one way or another. Uh, but yeah, there are some examples. Then there are, of course, uh, there is there are also some attempts to really uh, completely and uh, low level model the human brain as in modeling all neurons. And uh, so there is a human brain uh, project. Uh, which I will put the link here and you can get more info. Uh, yeah, so I, I was thinking more in terms of, um, you know, is there a, you know, so for example, you, you've got like the digit span, right? So, um, but is there like a, a, some, you know, maybe model that can, you know, predict when, um, you know, a human is, is less likely to be able to correctly model, cognitively model their environment. You know, like, uh, you know, maybe it might, mm. so for example, you might have a model that can predict, I don't know, where, uh, if we'd be susceptible to an optical illusion, for example. Like, it, so is there one that can predict, you know, when our... Okay. Yeah. So, so you mean uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, the limits of... Uh the complexity you can achieve. That's correct, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there are models for specific things. So for example, you mentioned illusions, and there are computational models that uh, explain, or let's say, uh, add something to the explanation of why do we experience certain illusions, and so why do we make mistakes. Uh, uh, so those things, there are computational models, and those are typically specific for a, for a specific thing, right? It could be for a, visual, for a certain visual illusion or 
etc. In terms of a general model that will tell you what is the level of what we can achieve and we can possibly achieve uh, and what we could not ever achieve, uh, I, I don't think so. And even if there was, I think there would, let's say, there would still be something uh, maybe proposed, but uh, very questionable. So because of our understanding of uh, our uh, limits uh, and potential is, uh, is to, um, is too shallow at the moment that we don't, I mean, we don't really know. Uh, I guess if you ask to anybody, uh, even from the, you know, psychology, neuroscience or other or cognitive sciences, it will probably tell you that we know so little yet that we don't know what are our limits. Yeah. So I don't think that exists, to be honest. Okay, I will answer the last one because then um, I think we have to close. Uh, how is the texture of a real material extracted for vibrotactile feedback? Okay, yeah. So also for that uh, question, Anastasia, if you are interested in more details, uh, uh, so in the publication that is cited in the in my presentation, you you, are, you will be able to get a bit more details. But the main idea is. So uh, we so we are providing this uh, vibrating feedback on the um, on the user finger with with this small vibrating motor, right? So this is a small motor on a board that will vibrate and gives to the human the the feeling. So to record the real textures, so the digital version of the real textures, we attached a small uh, um, accelerometer to the vibrating motor. We did not actuate the vibrating motor, so the vibrating motor is still, it's not moving, but it has this small accelerometer on it. And with that, we, we swipe, we, we rub the, the finger with the accelerometer and the little board of, uh, of the vibrating motor. We move that along different surfaces and we record the pattern of uh, accelerations experienced by, uh, by the device while moving. And by doing that, uh, we can recreate uh, a pattern of a surface based on the uh, peaks and dips of the acceleration profile. Right? And once we have that signal, then we reproduce that signal in terms of vibrations. And of course, we have to combine a specific material with the movement done by the person when they are virtually rubbing that material. So when we reproduce the feedback, we need to know which material we are reproducing, but also we need to track the movement of the finger so that depending on the, the speed of the finger, um, and so the, let's say the distance traveled by the finger, we can reproduce, the, we can map and let's say scale the same uh, stimulation that we recorded. Hopefully this makes sense. Uh, but in any case, uh, if you want more details about that, please check the, the paper. All right. Uh, yeah, I think this was this was it for for today, and uh, thank you, thank you all for for attending. Uh, as I said, this is uh, recorded, so you can access it later. And other than that, I wish you a nice Friday and good weekend, and uh, I'll see you on uh, uh, Tuesday for the lecture for the next lecture. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone.